Well, good morning and welcome again to our midweek lesson. And our theme has been discipleship evangelism because this is what Jesus commissioned us to do at his resurrection, at his death, burial, and resurrection. This was his commis commission to us is that we are to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations not just individuals but nations to have an impact and influence on the culture in which we live so we are to bring to our culture the principles and the values of God and how heaven operates we are to demonstrate that and teach that to the people. So today our subtopic, again this is taken from the Discipleship Evangelism course from uh, Karis Bible College. The president and founder is Andrew Womack. Our teacher today is Don Crow. But no more consciousness of sins. And he's just going to give a little story here and then we'll go into the Q&A. There's quite a few questions that he will and scriptures that we will look at, look at in the Q&A, but just a little story to start with. So Don tells this story about a drunken man who was in his automobile. He was driving in the wrong direction and he had a head-on collision with another car. And in this accident, a young 18-year-old girl was killed. And the family sued the man and won $1.5 million in the lawsuit. But instead of taking the money, the family settled for $900 Thirty-six dollars, nine hundred thirty-six dollars, not the one and a half million. But the reason was that they wanted the man to pay this money in a specific manner. They wanted the man who had been drunk to remember what he had done to their daughter. So he was to write out a check in the name of the girl he had killed for one dollar each week and send it to the family. Now you would think that a settlement of nine hundred and thirty six dollars would be a good deal compared to one point five million dollars. But at first paying the one dollar a week was easy. It was simple, but after a while Writing a check in the name of the girl he had killed began to dominate his thinking. Every week he went into depression thinking about what he had done to this girl. So after years of this, you know, this went on week after week after week. There's 52 weeks in a year. So after several years, he finally quit making the payments. And the family took him back to court and ordered him to resume making the payments. So in the last six or seven years, he quit making payments four or five times. However, each time the family took him back to court and again he was made to resume making the payments of one dollar a week. The family said they weren't angry anymore. You know, they were bitter. They were upset by what had happened in this accident. But they just wanted to remind this man over and over and over and every week of what he had done. <clears throat> so, if you think about it, that family was in bondage just as much as the man making the payments because every week they got a check and it kept reminding them, the family, of their loss. 
So in a sense, they couldn't put their daughter's death behind them either. So just think about that. Now, this man is suing the family for what he calls cruel and unusual punishment. He says, this is killing me. It's destroying my life. I can never put the past behind me and go on with my life. Well, you know, he did kill a person, but it also was punishing the family as well. So, we get to the Q&A. What kind of relationship can this man have with the family while this thing kind of thing is going on? I mean, he's having to write this check every week. Week after week. One dollar a week. So what kind of relationship can this man have with this family? Well, there's a lot of bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness on both sides because of this. So read Hebrews chapter 10. What could the law not do? So Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 says, For the law, talking about what we have in the Old Covenant, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers or the worshipers thereunto perfect. So what could the law not do? Well, it couldn't make the worshipers perfect. It could just remind them over and over and over, I'm a sinner. I have to continually bring these sacrifices year after year after year to remind myself of who I am and what I've done. That I have, I have been a lawbreaker. So it didn't absolve the worshiper of their sins. It was just a constant reminder. Read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, made the comers or the worshipers they're unto perfect. So what does this verse say that gives us an indication that the sacrifices of the Old Testament were inadequate to make us perfect? Well, it says that they, they will not make the worshiper perfect. They're just a shadow of good things to come. They're not the very image of the things. These sacrifices are never going to absolve, absolve the things that we have done wrong in our lives. They're just going to continually, just like the story that we started with, it's just going to be a continual reminder of what we've done wrong. Read Hebrews chapter 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, talking about the sacrifices, because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sin? So the question is, if a sacrifice came that could really deal with sin, what would it do for the worshipers? Well, this says that the worshipers, even though they were bringing these sacrifices, it, n it n did not purge them of having a conscience of sin. If there was a sacrifice that could really deal with sins, then there would be no more consciousness of sin in our life if there was a perfect sacrifice to take the, the, the sin away 
if you will but these sacrifices couldn't take away the sin or its consequences so what was the drunk driver forced to do he was forced to constantly be reminded of the deed that he had done that he had uh, he was drunk he was driving on the wrong in the wrong direction and he had killed a person as a result he was constantly week after week after week after week he was constantly reminded of that it was reinforced every week that he had done this wrong deed so read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified now the one offering he being Jesus by one offering Jesus has perfected forever them that are sanctified so God perfects his people by is it good works nope going to church nope keeping the ten commandments nope the offering the sacrifice of Jesus he as John the Baptist said behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 again it says by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified so Jesus' offering received by faith perfects the believer A. until the next time they sin B. from their past sins C. forever well Hebrews chapter 10 says he has perfected them forever 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 not until the next time not from their past sins only but forever read Genesis chapter 20 verse 1 through 18 now I'm not going to read all that I'm just going to read the portions that deals with the script uh, with the question but you can read the entire story if you haven't before and, and it's good to always read it again but in Genesis chapter 20 verses 1 and 2 it says and Abraham journeyed from there towards the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and journeyed in Gerar and Abraham said of Sarah his wife she is my sister and Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah okay so who are the two men mentioned in this story well the first one is Abraham and the next one is Abimelech who is the king of Gerar alright in verses 2 and 5 it says and Abraham said of Sarah his wife she is my sister and Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah okay so if Sarah's uh, according to Abraham if Sarah is his sister then Abimelech didn't do anything wrong did he verse 5 it says said he not unto me she's my sister and she even she herself said he is my brother in the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands have I done this so who was the man who lied and deceived the other in this story was it a king Abimelech or was it Abraham it was Abraham he lied well he said well it's a little half lie she is my half sister but you know he didn't tell the whole he, it was not full disclo disclosure she was his wife so he lied to Abimelech and he deceived a, a king Abimelech 
and let him believe that Sarah was only his sister and not his wife. Now, read verse 7. It says, Now therefore restore, and this is talking to Abimelech, Now therefore restore the man, his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for you, and you shall live. And if you restore her not, know that you shall surely die, you and all that are yours. Now, do you think that God approved of what Abraham did? But in this story, who do you think God sided with? Was it with Abraham or with Abimelech? Well, this says that God told Abimelech that if he didn't restore Abraham's wife, that Abimelech was going to die and everybody with him. So God rebuked King Abimelech, even though he didn't know that he was doing anything wrong. That doesn't make sense, does it? So why? Why did God rebuke King Abimelech and not say anything to Abraham? Well, read Genesis 15.1. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a dream. This is before he had Isaac. And he said, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Then read um, verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And then James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So why did God not rebuke Abraham? Abraham was his friend. God had entered into a covenant with Abraham. God had not entered into a covenant with King Abimelech. Now, you know, who are you going to favor? A friend or somebody that you don't know or, you know, that you have a casual relationship with? Who are you going to side with? Are you going to take your friend's side? Or are you going to take the other person's side? God says he's my friend. I made a covenant with him. Now, was he pleased with what Abraham did? Or, you know, here was Abimelech, and he saw Sarah, and don't you think that Abimelech had other wives? But he saw that she was a beautiful woman, and he took her. So, it's kind of a strange story, isn't it? Read Genesis chapter 20, verse 7, and verses 17 and 18. So we'll come back to that. It says, verse 7, Now therefore restore the man his wife, talking to King Abimelech, for Abraham, Abraham is a prophet, and Abraham shall pray for you, and you shall live. And if you restore her not, know that you shall surely die, you and all that are yours. And then verses 17 and 18. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife, See, Abimelech already had a wife, and his maidservants, and they bore children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So, even though Abraham was in the wrong, who did God say should pray for the other? 
Well, he said that Abraham, he, he told Abraham to pray for Abimelech and ask the Lord to heal Abimelech and his household for they were not able to conceive or to have children. So God told uh, Abraham to pray for Abimelech. <laughs> now, you would think it would be the other way around, that Abraham was the one that lied and deceived Abimelech, but God told Abraham to pray for Abimelech because of what had happened as a result of taking Sarah into his household. Read Romans chapter 8 verse 31. Even though we sometimes fail, who is on our side? Romans 8 31 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? God was on Abraham's side. He said that Abraham was a prophet and he had Abraham to pray for King Abimelech. God's on our side. Who can be against us? Read Romans chapter 4 verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So even though we make mistakes, what did God say he would not do? He would not impute sin or charge us with sin. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. I think about the woman that was caught in adultery then was brought to Jesus in John chapter 8. And Jesus said to the woman, where are your accusers? And she says, there isn't any. And he said, neither do I condemn you. And I think about what it says in John chapter 3, verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. There is no condemnation according to Romans chapter 8. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Read Hebrews 8, verses 12 and 13. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he said, a new covenant... He has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So in the new covenant, what did God promise he would not do? Well, he said, I won't remember their sins or their iniquities. That, I will, that he would be merciful to their unrighteousness. So he wouldn't remember them. It wouldn't be like the story that we began with, with the drunk man, that the family forced him to remember week after week after week what he had done. Well, that's exactly what happened under the old covenant. Day after day, week after week, year after year, they had to constantly be reminded of their sins because they had to bring sacrifices. They had to bring them regularly. So it was always a consciousness of sin because of those sacrifices that had to be made. But read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, and verses 8 and 9. Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. Verses 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, 
not of works, lest any man should boast. So how are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's not something that we deserved. It's not something that we earned. It's not something that we do. It's not based on performance by our part. We're saved by grace. Unmerited favor. We didn't deserve it. We were dead in sins. But Christ brought us to life. You know, the man, the drunk man said, you know, this is killing me. Week after week after week to write this check and send it to the family. This is killing me. I can't let go of the past because of this. I can't live a new life because of this. But Jesus has made us alive because of what he did for us. Read Titus chapter 3 verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So how are we not saved? We're not saved by works of righteousness that we have done. Nothing that we can do can save us except receiving the grace and the mercy that is provided for us. Not, I don't cling to anything except to the cross of Christ that I cling. That's the only thing that can save me from my sins. Read Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he, Jesus, has made us accepted in the beloved. So we will praise God throughout all eternity for saving us by his grace. For he has made us accepted in the beloved. There's no more consciousness of sin. We can't live that way. And if we live that way, there's always that burden that I've got to do something to make it right. And we can never make it right. Just like this drunk man, year, week after week after week, year after year, he was having to write that check of one dollar a week. For 936 weeks. I mean, really. This was unusual punishment. But that's how we feel a lot of times. But we have to get to the place where we realize that it's nothing that I do. It's what Jesus has done for me. And all I do is receive what he has provided for me and to give him praise and honor and glory for all eternity just to love him to know that he loves us with an everlasting love that he has paid the penalty for our sins and that we can live in newness of life I think about King David. He's a perfect example. That he committed adultery. He had the husband of the woman that he had committed adultery with. He had him killed on the battlefield. He tried to cover it up. He tried to deceive the people and let people think that he had not done anything wrong. But the Lord knew. And he was rebuked. And when he, when Nathan the prophet came to him and pointed out to him, you're the man, you've done this. Well, David truly, 
truly repented. And the child that was conceived in that adulterous relationship, it died. And David was heartbroken as it was sick. And at the point of death, he was just praying and praying. And when the baby died, he just went and washed himself. And he just got up and began to praise the Lord. He said, they asked, said, well, while the child was was uh, dying, you were all upset and you were praying and, and you were fasting and, and all these things. But now that the child is dead, you've washed yourself and you're praising God. And, you know, what's the change here? And he says, we well, you know I can't bring them back, but I'll, I can go to him. We look to the future because we have a hope. We have a hope in Jesus Christ. And we know that in him, you know, when we get into his presence, literally, physically, in our spiritual bodies, when we enter into, leave this world and, and go to be in the Father's house, there will be no more consciousness of sin. God's not going to sit up there on the throne and say, look, I remember what you did when you were five years old. No. Or I remember what you did when you were 16 or 20 or 30 or whatever. He's not going to do that. He's just going to say, come here, my child. I love you. And I just want to bless you for all eternity. That's our God. He's our Father. Just like a parent. May not always like what we do, but His love will never end for us. We are beloved in Jesus Christ. So I hope that if you're holding on to something, a guilt or a shame, that you just can't get rid of, I just pray that you will grasp this concept that in Christ there is no condemnation. And there should be no more consciousness of sin. That, as it says, I believe in Thessalonians, uh, um, I think it's Corinthians, uh, where it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All of that is in the past. You're a new creation. You're a brand new person. And we can live a victorious life in and through Jesus Christ, our precious Lord and Savior. Amen.